Once we get in there, we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing and, uh, and the timber sale, etc. Every single mushroom that you take home tonight will be looked at by me and approved as to its edibility. And then when you get home tonight, you will also relook at all of your mushrooms. And if it looks weird, if in doubt, throw it out. So. What did you say about this one? <laughs> that one is edible. All right, I All guess right, we can start well, this. Yeah, start with that. Object lesson. So somebody was slightly eager, and they actually got out into the woods already. And this is the majority of the mushrooms that we're probably going to find today. This is a chanterelle, Cantharella sabarius, and these are excellent edibles. And uh, I would suggest the method for picking mushrooms is basically to twist and pull up, and then cut the butt. And that dirt on the bottom of this mushroom, if you leave it in your bag or your basket, is just going to get all over all of your other mushrooms and be a huge hassle to clean when you get home. So cut the butt out in the woods. You don't need to take out any more biomass than necessary anyway. And when you get home, a uh, clean, unused paintbrush is the best way to clean mushrooms. And you just brush them off. Um, if you were to run this under the water, especially on chanterelles, uh, it will just soak up tons and tons and tons of water. Other mushrooms you can wash, but generally you just use a paintbrush to, to wipe them off. Do you have any uh, comments about cutting at the base to leave them like the immune pack? Yeah, the general accepted rule for uh, picking mushrooms is to twist and pull it out of the ground and then cut the butt. You don't have to. Now, mushrooms are literally apples on a tree, so what you're picking is the fruit of this, this root, this fungus. And there are a lot of mushrooms you can just cut, but there are a few out there that you really shouldn't, and you should pluck and cut. So I just teach everybody to you know, twist, pull, and cut the butt. And you shouldn't even identify them. Well, if you are picking a mushroom that you want to identify, you absolutely need to have the base because you need to know if it's growing on soil or wood or on another mushroom or etc. 
Um, so it's good, especially if you're trying to do some identification of mushrooms, you should definitely have the base of it. If you cut it off, it could be an Amanita and you wouldn't know it's got this whole sack and all these other characteristics to it. So let's get out of this parking lot. We're going a mile on this road. And if anybody wants baskets, beyond the clear cut is one of the units that's that's marked out for the sale um, and it stretches from where it ends where the forest kind of ends there all the way um, and then up this road and you're going to see this sort of nature trail that goes off to the right that um, an outdoor school uses and it's it goes through that also um, and there is one square mile um, no this unit is 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 a much is much smaller than that um, but you're right that most of the other units are, of the sale are, tend to be within a single section, so they're square miles. But, um, and there's a, a patch, it's, you know, not a, it's, I think it's only like one or two acres in, on, the, on the right side here that um, has some uh, remnant old growth. Um, it's in a, there's a really, really remarkably large cedar tree in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing. But, yeah, this is a really beautiful path of forest. But unfortunately, we're not going yet. <laughs> <laughs> violet quartz. It's, the, it's violet, violet court, with a B? Violet. violet. Oh, yeah, violet. Because of the color. The okay. violet quartenarius. Is, is that edible? I would just any, anything that color would be. No, edible. and it's actually semi poison. Uncommon, okay. not rare, but uncommon. I've actually seen it in the other spot that we're going in much bigger form. Whatever, it's just a absolutely fabulously beautiful mushroom. Yeah, this whole forest is super mycologically rich. There's tons and tons of species out here, and there are tons that aren't fruiting this year that might fruit next year or might not fruit for another ten years. Is it because there's a lot of rotting and de dead material here? Is it? It's, it's so rich in, in fungus. Yeah, it's because this is a, a, a natively regenerated or naturally regenerated from some old uh, high grading that occurred probably 50, 60 years ago. So all this stuff came back by itself, and it's basically a native. It is a native forest, and so it's got all this down woody material that lots of mushrooms like, and it's got all the natural processes that have been going on for millions of years here. And it's, when you look at this forest, it's got a nice mix of species, nice understory. Everything's here. There's not too many uh, unnative or non-native species here. And it's doing a great job of coming back from some high-grade logging years and years ago. So we don't have to necessarily replant and manage it. It knows how to take care of yeah, itself. It's what a obviously concept. doing a fine job by itself. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll show you what uh, some other folks have done to this same watershed, the same ecosystem. Uh, farther down this trail and uh, see what the BLM proposes for this area.
actually this fine dead top old growth uh, awesome Douglas fir of what used to be in this forest. Oh and God. as we walk around, I mean, you'll see some of these uh, stumps out here that were equally as big as this. And there's a couple of live ones still that um, are a little bit smaller. But that's what used to be here. And that's what the potential for this area is, this kind of stuff. And if we can actually eventually look out, this is Gordon Creek down there. And what you can't really see is it's gone on the other side of this hill and actually just at the base of this hill too, which is the private land, Frank Lumber or uh, Longview Fiber. Um, and it's in this turf right down to the, to the creek. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the, the BLM and the public land agencies only look at the impacts and they don't look that well at the impact of their project actions. Uh, but they don't look at, in these kind of cases, the impacts of what else is going on in the watershed. So they say, oh, well, that's private land. doesn't really have anything to do with the public land, even though it's gone. Um, and so the, the actions that they are going to be looking at for this proposed sale, and we are in one of the units, the proposed units, they're not going to look at any sort of cumulative impacts on erosion from this place down into Gordon Creek, along with what's already going on, obviously, and will be going on for years from all these clear cuts and the dozens of miles of roads that are in this area. And in this sale, the Gordon Creek uh, timber sale, uh, there's lots of roads that they want to reconstruct. Um, we'll be walk walking on some later. Um, and so there's, I can't remember how many miles. See, I think there's something like 120 miles of roads already in the Gordon Creek watershed, and they want to construct eight miles of new roads, um, some of which they, they're, they're calling temporary, but they're not going to get rid of the actual road bed when they're done, and so because they want to be able to come back and use them for logging again in the future. And so there's some doublespeak going on in their environmental assessment where they say, oh, the roads are temporary, we're going to remove them, but then in the very next sentence they say, but we're going to leave the road bed in place. And then they go on to say, so there will be no regeneration of the forest in those areas. So, anyway. <laughs> so when you, when you say 120 miles of road in, yeah. a, in, a, in an area, I mean, is, is that a lot or is that a little? I mean, if the area is, you know, 20 miles, I mean, 120... Um, I mean, it might not be a lot. I, I have no. That that, that doesn't mean actually, anything I'm to me. Sorry, it wasn't. You know? I, I, the mileage was the wrong number. It was 120 um, effective acres of road of road bed in the watershed. Um, and if you think of that, that's 120 acres of um, unprotected, high erosion, high impact surfaces um, that will continue to be be that way because you know people can drive on them and do whatever else. So, but it's. You're right. I'm not. Well, I'm not I, sure. I, I, I'm not sure. You're right. Yeah, I'm not answering your question. The, you know, relative to the to the the, the complete the, size of the area you're talking. Sure. That does, that's just a number. Right. So. And to be honest, I'm not. I don't know the the relative percent, the number of acres in the watershed as opposed to the number of acres of roads. I, I don't know that number to be honest. So. so. I, I, I don't. You know. I'm 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 all for saving forests. No, no. It's, I not, think, it's a good question. You know. It's, I think, are, you know. You could be just as misleading. Sure. Or. Just, or you sure. Know, like, you know, oh, this is a big number, you know, and so right. people think, whoa, but is it? Yeah. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying, you know, well, you know. Yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're saying. Mark, I have a question about, I know that riparian zones are protected when they're, well, theoretically, <laughs> marked off in timber sales. On private land, are they marked off, or is, can they go right down to the creek in private land? Is it well, monitored? It's, it's, or? it's interesting because supposedly Oregon has some of the strongest state forestry land use laws in the country. And if we were to hike up another couple miles, and I think on one of these other hikes, people have seen it, there's a square mile clear cut of private land, and it just went right over this stream and up the other side. So even though we supposedly have some of the best, you know, timber practices on state lands, on public land, or on private lands, um, either they get away with stuff because people are looking the other way, or people aren't even coming out to look and inspect on these operations that are happening, and so they go ahead and do it. And once it's done, it's done. So is it regulated? Uh, theoretically, is it's it It's all regulated on uh, private land. Uh, the buffers are, you know, a couple hundred feet or whatnot. On public land, it's one or two 
what they call site potential tree lengths. And you now, to me, of course, here's, here's a good example. The site potential tree height in this spot that we're standing in could be 300 feet tall based on this old tree, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're actually going to be looking at what's actually here right now, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's 100 feet or 80 feet or 90 feet. So the numbers get played around with incredibly, as we all know about mm -hmm. politics and whatnot. So, yeah, but this really is the site potential tree height, you know, whatever, however high that thing was. This sail is designated as thinning, um, which means the idea, um, the idea is, is that they want to remove, th th this, they consider this forest to be overcrowded with trees right now. And so the idea is that they're going to come in and thin and allow the strongest trees to get bigger faster. And so it'll, it'll uh, become old growth faster. That's kind of the idea. Um, but their proposal for the thinning is to leave uh, 10 to 14 trees per acre throughout this area. <laughs> to come and cut later. Yeah, exactly. But that's their idea of uh, thinning. What, what would appropriate thinning be? What would you think? I don't want to answer that because <laughs> personally I don't think that, that thinning has any real purpose other than to be an excuse for logging, but that's Cut kind later. of just my own opinion. Uh, and um, opinions do vary on that in yeah. the environmental community. For, of course, yeah. I mean, and there are some, there, there's, it's, a, it's a very contentious debate as opposed to in, in, the, in the context of forest management, like what is appropriate to, to do. So. And it would be site specific too as well. What's that? It would be site specific too, according to what, how many trees you would cut in a, in a, in a, in a partial cut. That the, right. that the area could That's true. Could I mean, even if you want to just think about, you know, areas that are right along, you know, stream beds, for example, you know, one of the, the ways they measure stream health is um, the temperature of the stream. And so a high density of vegetation and trees right around a stream is, is a really good thing in that case. So the amount of paper and fiber and wood products that the U.S. economy gets off of public lands is 3.3 percent of the demand. We recycle a lot in Portland and the West Coast and whatnot. Uh, just recycling another 5% in the rest of the country, we could easily stop the need, the quote need, for any logging of any further public lands in this country. Um, some more alternatives, you know, straw bale, whatever, all these different kind of ideas that we have heard about. So in reality, we don't need to be logging another tree off of our national forest. And in many ways, a lot of folks would really like to see the Forest Service and the BLM become stewards of the forest and go in and fix some of the problems that they've caused over the last hundred years, take out a bunch of roads, get the fish to be able to come back up these streams, probably do a little bit of thinning in some of these plantations where they planted pines where it should be Douglas firs, you know. They do a lot of this kind of stuff, so there would definitely be a lot of jobs and a lot of work in the forest on public lands if we actually decided as a society that we really do need to force these agencies to change their mandate from uh, you know, a lot of logging and a little and less recreation and all these other factors and start you know, restoring all of these lands that are all of ours. So Mark, what is the other 97% of the demand? <laughs> the other 97% of the land, uh, demand gets met from this kind of stuff over here. So, you know, we don't have as much of a say on those kind of uh, privately owned properties, though in reality we really should. Nobody really should be able to destroy salmon habitat by cutting down and across streams like that, which are great salmon habitat. Um, so there should be some more enforcement abilities to stop that kind of stuff. Um, private land issues, you know, we could talk for 10 hours on the ability of, you know, a private person to do what they want on their property. That's what 49 is all about, right? Right. <laughs> Can you guys give us a visual of an acre here? 204 feet by 204 feet is an acre and square. what's the density right now? Uh, I don't know what the density is here. But you can kind of look up and, and they call this like canopy closure. Uh, and if you look straight up, how much sky can you actually see out of your circle of vision in maybe 15%, so it's probably like an 85% canopy closure, rough estimate. Uh, 
And with only 14 trees left, uh, for one, that will severely impact the microclimate and the habitat here for all mm -hmm. these fungi and mm -hmm. all these other plants and whatnot. So this place would get a lot drier in the summer, um, a lot more, um, uh, or a lot more brush will come up, and it would probably be quite a few years before a lot of these mushroom species that you see right now would be able to come back because they need this canopy closure, which provides a temperature gradient and a, uh, a uh, moisture gradient that obviously these you know mushrooms require. So it would probably be a good. 10, 20, 30 years before a lot of the species of mushrooms that you're seeing right now would be able to come back. Has this forest ever been cut in the past? Oh yeah. And How you'll long see, ago? Uh, hard to tell, but um, it's naturally regenerated um, 50, 60 years ago. Could be longer. Um, How many times has it been cut? As far as I can tell, it looks like it's only been cut once. Mm -hmm. you know, the big fat trees is what they cut out. Yeah. Doesn't the proximity to large metropolitan areas like Portland and Vancouver kind of give it a, a, a reason to be preserved for um, recreation? Absolutely, and that's one of the things, like when we're hiking around here today, I mean, it's a beautiful spe uh, place. There's some, you know, some nasty clear cuts and whatnot, but this place still has recreational value. For one, it has you know, mycological value. We're going to pick those and take them home and eat them. Uh, so there are all these other values besides talking about you know, the very specifics of 14 trees per acre and blah, 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 all those kind of you know, wonky factoidal stuff. You know, when we take people out on these hikes, the reason we do it is because you can read the environmental assessment that the BLM sent out just like I ha am and uh, and get all those factoids and make your decision there. But once you get out into these areas, you get a little bit of you know soul from it or some feeling from it, and you can make a much better comment to the agency based on the fact that you had a great time out here and you probably will come back out here hiking if you want or mushroom picking or taking your dog for a walk or whatever. So there are these other factors that these agencies do not look at unless the public brings them up. So that's why, you know, one of the reasons why Bark does these hikes and has all of you, you know, write comments about this timber sale um, so that the agencies will look at different values that the public uh, wants to see taken into consideration. In this area, I was here uh, a week ago and I found a frog and most of the frogs in this area are endangered. Uh, so this frog uh, really want you to, if you see a frog out here, let me know because we're going to try and identify it, take some good photos and whatnot. Um, the photos that I took were really grainy. It could be a red-legged Northern California, or Northern red-legged frog or whatnot. Anyway, there's multiple species that are endangered. So if you see a frog out here, let me know and uh, we'll take some photos. If it's endangered, it would be extremely helpful for uh, affecting the uh, outcome. Yeah. So if anybody has uh, this, like, 
questions on poisonous mushrooms. You can touch them, you can breathe in their spores, which we're actually right now breathing in millions and millions and millions of spores of edible and non-edible and probably potentially toxic mushrooms right now. They're not hurting us. You could lick the top of an amanita if you wanted to. Um, if you were to eat, a lot of actually people, some people uh, eat amanitas recreationally. Um, no, the stories I've heard weren't super recreational in my book. Um, but you can touch any poisonous mushroom. Uh, you know, you can have it sit next to your other mushrooms, whatever. Just don't eat it. Um, it's not going to, you know, come in through your skin or anything like that, so it's safe. This one is edible as well. It'll grow, like we're seeing it down here. It grows on, uh, you can tell it's growing off of some old wood, some rotten wood in the ground. It's not the best edible, but it's edible. And if you were to eat it, you know, it's got this nice red striping on the stem. And this is usually a lot purplier, that's the word. And it's got all these little bumps and stuff on top, yellow uh, tubes. And uh, if you were to eat it, you would take off the tube layer, just peel that off, basically chuck that because it gets really goopy and, and not very appetizing. And then you could fry it up in a little butter and garlic and salt and whatnot and chow down. I don't find them to be that wonderful, but uh, just like I don't like beets. <laughs> you know, just because just because somebody in the in the mushroom book says you know it doesn't taste very good doesn't mean you're not going to love it so it does it does pay to try stuff so behind us is the water intake and the water supply for the city of corbett who has just come on board uh to get involved in the the comment process for this timber sale because this area behind us is part of the timber sale that area back there, a whole square mile up here, and then a whole big section up here, and some other sections around are part of this timber sale and could conceivably negatively impact the uh, city of Corbett's water supply. So they actually asked for an extension on the comment period. The, the sheet I gave you said November 20, October 26th, but it's now been extended to November 15th. Um, so they decided, they act, called the BLM and said, hey, we want to you know, look at this a little bit further. Um, so that's a positive move as well. For one, that they gave us more time to make comments um, because with this many people, this is a, a great amount of people to, to make even some more comments on this sale. How substantially would uh, cutting this interfere with Corbett's water supply? It just depends. I'm not a hydrologist, so it would really take someone who understands the geology of this area and the hydrology of this area and figures out how many trees they're going to cut and where, um, and where actually they're uh, water supply comes from. Does it come from up here or down, you know, Gordon Creek area? I'm not exactly sure where their water directly comes from. So, but that's the thing. They should have, you know, the BLM should have a hydrologist on staff that goes into that aspect of, you know, the city of Corbett looking and asking questions about it. And they should write up, you know, what impacts it will have. What's the population of Corbett? It can't be more than like seven or eight hundred. It's a pretty small little town. We passed through it on the road. They, the BLM did, as a part of their environmental assessment, do some, you know, basic, uh, I don't know, estimates as to how how much sedimentation would increase, um, how much runoff would increase into Gordon Creek, and they they estimate within uh, within the first five years after cutting, the sedimentation into into Gordon Creek will increase ten times. Um, and the, um, the Water Bureau, one of the reasons I think that they're concerned, um, or at least they've, one of the reasons they've told us they're concerned, is that they've already had um, a lot of problems with sediment in, in the water supply here. They've, they're, they're, this treatment facility has been clogged a couple of times um, just from the sediment that's, that's already in the stream. And there are, I think, ten wells that they get water from um, in this area, and I think five of them are within the units for the timber sale. So, or I don't know if they're wells or how exactly it works, but it's something that, so they're, they at least want to be part of the conversation, I think, for that reason. And this one isn't so much saddle shaped, but it oftentimes has just this perfect, like a leather horse saddle. And of course, the idea for it came from you know, elves riding mushrooms, like the elfin saddle. Perfect, that's the perfect classic elfin saddle.
old road that has <laughs> grown up a little bit with some salal. And we're following the flagging in. We're going to go in about three, four hundred feet, and it'll open up into a nice area where we can stop and talk again um, and do some filming. Um, but it is going to be brushy. Fungi have this incredible 400 million year history uh, on this planet at least. And all of the mushrooms that you are seeing right now are in a symbiotic relationship, either with the salal that we're walking through, or the Douglas firs, or the cedars, or the hemlocks that are the, the dominant tree species here. And that symbiotic relationship is uh, incredible. And so the, the roots of the mushroom, the actual mycelium, the fungus, is in contact and in association with the roots of all of these other plants that are out here. And the tree produces all these photosynthates when it photosynthesizes. 50% of those photosynthates go down to its roots. And 90% of that 50 is given to the fungus. The fungus, as well, has this incredible mycelial network of very tiny filaments of the, of the mycelium that basically incredibly exponentially expand the collection area of the root system for all of these plants. So if this was one tree's root system, the fungus does another 50 times that in surface area in the soil to bring in water and phosphorus and nitrogen and all these other things that these trees require almost year round. I mean, a lot of these trees, depending on where they are in the Northwest, are photosynthesizing all year. If it gets too cold, they'll stop. But a lot of trees, a lot of forests in the West side basically are growing all year round. However, in the Northwest especially, we have a three month drought in summer, basically. And nothing can grow without water. So especially during summer, all of these underground networks, these mycelial networks, are feeding these trees water, especially. And the tree is feeding this mushroom, you know, all these other nutrients. And it's a relationship that we know very, very little about, um, other than there's a couple different kinds of, it's called mycorrhizae, mycos, fungus, and rhizal is root. Um, and it's the fungus attached to the root of the tree or the shrub. And uh, some of these fungi actually penetrate the cells of the root and become kind of one with the tree. And other ones just wrap around the outside of the root and exchange you know, nutrients that way. These forests would not and could not be here without this mycorrhizal association. And these fungi and these mushrooms would not and could not be here without this forest. So they think that in the temperate uh, ecosystems on the planet that the mycorrhizal association, the fungus and the tree uh, association was created based on the fact that in a lot of these temperate areas there is this three month drought during summer which is the prime time to reproduce and grow and, and uh, photosynthesize. So what we are walking on is this incredible mycelial network of millions and billions of miles of mycelial uh, hyphae and, and uh, threads, the white threads, and if you actually dig up the soil, you can see some of the white threads, or the brown, or the yellow, or all these different colors, and that's all this fungus that is down there that is interconnecting this entire forest as, in many ways, almost one living organism. They claim that if a tree seedling sprouts in this forest, it will die within 48 hours if it does not get that mycorrhizal association attached to its roots because the trees that because the system is so uh, long-standing and now basically required these trees cannot grow without this association that that seedling will die unless it gets that association as well and they've done these studies where a area was deficient in phosphorus and these are all different tree species and we've all been told in our, in our education that this entire system is fighting for its survival, and that tree is fighting for the sunlight and the water and the soil nutrients, etc. And it's this huge, you know, 
what is it, raw and tooth and nail, and claw and tooth, whatever it is. Red and tooth. Red and tooth. Mm -hmm. and nail. <laughs> anyway, I, I think that's bull. Um, I don't really think it works. There's this interconnectedness out here that we don't even know anything about or know very little about. And so they did this study where they dropped a bunch of phosphorus off at the base of this one tree, Douglas Fir will say. And in two hours, that underground mycelial network had transported that phosphorus to a hemlock tree, an entirely different species, 100 yards away. And so you have to under question well, who told it. To, I mean, it brings up all these questions, right? Did the tree say, hey, buddy, go get me some phosphorus? You know, whatever the deal is. And is it really this underground, unseen mycelial network that is really kind of the, one of the dominating, controlling factors in these ecosystems? Who knows? Lots of things to ponder. So one of the things that, you know, when we are tromping through these forests, we are damaging mycelial networks. That's just a given. So just be aware of that. And, you know, when you pick these mushrooms, be sure to put the, uh, the duff back in place. Try and do as little disturbance. There's 34 of us. And the dogs. And the dogs. And so there is going to be a lot of disturbance out here. Um, but do understand as well that picking these, these mushrooms, you really are picking the fruit, yeah. you know, the apple on the tree. So you're not actually hurting uh, the uh, fungus when you pick it. Uh, the moment that a mushroom cap opens, actually in many ways before that mushroom cap, now this cap was closed around the stem. And when it expanded, when it got all that water in it, uh, the moment it expanded, it started dropping spores. And a mushroom like this could produce 20 billion spores. You know, some of these uh, mushrooms are incredible, trillions and trillions of spores. So the reason that we are having you pick in baskets and permeable bags and whatnot is that issue, that you want to not destroy this wonderful thing that nature's giving us, but be able to let it, you know, reproduce and continue on. So you pick in these bags and uh, baskets that allow the spores from these mushrooms to spread as you're walking through the forest as well. Now picking, especially with the Matsutakis, you know, they like the ones that are closed, the cap hasn't opened up yet. And those, uh, there are issues with picking of those because they just pop up through the duff and they don't really pop out of the ground and so people will dig those out. And if you're an unscrupulous Matsutaki picker, you'll just dig it and leave it and not put it back. Um, so that has uh, impacts. They did a 20-year chanterelle study, actually in Bull Run Watershed, which is just over the hill there. And for 20 years, they picked 100% of the chanterelles, 90%, 70%, etc., and then left all of them there. And they actually found basically no statistical difference between picking 100% of the mushrooms, picking 50%, and leaving you know, some of them. So, so far, at least with the chanterelle species, it's not a, a big issue at all of picking all of them. Now, ethically, you can decide to, you know, there's five mushrooms in front of you, you can leave one. You can decide that. But there, uh, any other questions? Do these right. actual gills, um, the end at the bottom of yeah, the and these are all forks. I mean, they're, they're just gorgeous. They have all these weird little forks, mm -hmm. and they're very waxy. Um, so this is a chanterelle. Yeah. Okay. Are there Sabarius. many other that look like that on the top? No, no that's no. kind of squashed look. Yeah. Okay. And they'll be like perfectly round, and these are all wavy. It just depends on yeah. the age like and one. the uh, see. Yeah, and it's the exact same thing. Yeah, okay. that's a younger yeah, one. It's a honestly. younger one. Yeah. yeah. All right. We are going to go in on this road. It's a little brushy again, another 50, 60 feet, and it opens up incredibly open. And what has already happened is people did not stay within visual and auditory <laughs> range of the rest of the group. So what are all of us going to be doing? Because now we really are in the woods. You will stay within visual and auditory range of all of us because, yes, you could go downhill, you could get lost here. What we are going to do is go in on this road, two or three, four hundred more yards. It's going to open up a lot, and we're swinging back to the road that we just came in on. It will take a good hour or two hours to do that, picking mushrooms along the way. This entire forest is full of golden chanterelles.
there's an enzyme in all, mu all mushrooms should be cooked before you eat them. Um, the, there's an enzyme in all mushrooms that gets volatized off when you heat it, when you cook it. And uh, once that's volatized off, then you can actually uptake all of the nutrients that are in the mushroom. It's not going to kill you or hurt you necessarily to eat a raw mushroom, but if you want to get the nutrients out of it, you really do need to cook it. Oh, you got how many you got so far? Um, a couple of small ones. Some small ones there? Mm. Okay. Hard to get in there. Mm. All right. Oh, there they are down in there. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, you guys are getting some. How are you going to cook them up? I don't know yet. Probably with butter and garlic and spinach. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, here's a nice uh, bounty. A pound and a half here at least. Mm. Huh? I was wondering how much it would take to make a pound. It doesn't really take... Someone said it's 15 bucks a pound. So. Yeah, it really doesn't take much. And if you imagine, you know, even with these 30 people that we've got today, we're hiking around maybe 5, 10 acres of, of area in this forest. And we'll see how much we get at the end of the day, but we're going to get 25 pounds at least probably. Mm -hmm. you know, and if we really rent, went around in this area, we could get even more. And so the sustainability factor of being able to come back to a forest that's not logged and not destroyed and not damaged by roads and whatnot to every single year to come back and pick these mushrooms that you could sell or you could you know buy a permit from the Forest Service or the BLM and give some money back to the, the agency to you know do the right thing out here that'll go on forever you know mm -hmm. there's spring mushrooms you can pick out here there's fall mushrooms you can pick out here there's summer mushrooms you can pick out here so there's all these different species and when you're talking about mushrooms again you're not destroying the ecosystem. Um, obviously, you're going to leave some here, and you're going to pick you know, some. But it's a sustainable way for, if you really want to make some money off of forests, public lands, that you could sell permits for people like us to come out and pick mm -hmm. and uh, support the agency that would be doing the right thing out yeah. here. Mm -hmm. At this point, these agencies really you know, need a good push by the public to move into these directions where they really should be doing some more restoration and some cleaning up of past mistakes and disasters and road washouts and that kind of stuff. And then moving them more towards, you know, supporting activities like this. These are the serious pickers over here I can see. <laughs> How you doing there? Oh man, that's a nice one. Oh, wow. wow. Here's a good one. That's a nice one. <laughs> I think uh -huh. that might win the pool yeah. today. How are you plan on cooking that? Uh, simply. <laughs> simply, huh? That's the, that's the motto today. Yeah? I don't know. Actually, oh, I, look at this, this guy. is the, the only occasion in which I've been so fortunate to yeah. actually get mushrooms on a mushroom trip. Really? Huh. So uh, I guess it'll be a learning experience. Right. Well, I've asked a couple sure people. The they say it's a good place to look for recipes. Yeah. A couple of gals just said just saute them and butter, and one person mm. mentioned yeah. spinach. Mm. Spinach. Add some go. spinach. Yeah. We'll hook it up. Sounds good. Nope, it's not gonna be is going to have a big, uh, bigger bulb, bulb uh, or a sack, and that that's just pretty big. That's just an enlarged base. What is this? Do you know? I'm not sure what this one is. It could be a, a deer mushroom. No, that's not obvious. I'm not sure. The bugs were eating it. I thought that was a good sign. Well, the interesting thing with chanterelles is I haven't seen anything eat a chanterelle except for humans. <laughs> Deer don't, slugs mm -hmm. don't. They're out here and they're in perfectly pristine condition until they rot. All right, yeah. More than one night's dinner, huh? How well, you plan on cooking them up? There's eight of us. So. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Do anything fancy or just butter and... No, nothing fancy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> fancy is driving in a car for... An hour know, to get here. Two huh? hour round trip. And that little road that we came in on was actually a road that they want to rebuild. And then there was a one spot where it said proposed landing, which means that that's where they're going to build this huge cleared area and drag all these trees to that spot, put them on the trucks, and, that's where and the take yarder, them out. That's where the yarder sets up. Exactly, exactly. So imagine coming through here, and right now you can kind of, you know, there's a lot of shade on the ground, and that's what these mushrooms require. They need this environment, this temperature, etc. And imagine 14 trees left per acre. You know, and so we've hiked through maybe five acres or six acres right now. So imagine 80 trees out of the, you know, 2,000 that you've just walked by, past. Um, and so that, you know, if that timber sale happens, again, you wouldn't find these mushrooms here for 
a couple of decades probably because they need that microclimate. Hmm. What actually grows back after they thin it to that? To that well, level? all of these things will Weeds, grow back. Right? It's just that. Weeds. Well, that's one thing for sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but all of these things will. They'll just take a long time. The trees know. won't, though, will they? The trees will because come back. Because it's too much uh, light? Well, the, you know, the growth? Douglas fir will come back. I don't know if they have plans to replant this area or not. At 14 trees left per acre, they probably will have to replant. Um, so they'll replant, and all that light will actually, you know, help the Douglas firs and all these other trees grow. But it's going to take, you know, quite a long time for what, it to begin to look like this again. What, what effect will it have on the, the, the fungus beneath the ground that well, you talked that's, about? And that's a great factor because, again, this, this underground mycelial network that completely benefits all of these tree species out here and all the plants out here. You get these tractors in here, you get these road building machines in here, you get uh, dragging of uh, you know, trees, trees along yeah. the ground and you're crushing all of that, you're compacting that soil and that causes incredible damage to the mycelial network much less all the other soil stuff that's going on as well. And they heat so, light too. Right and so when you get all that light coming in and all that heat from the summer and whatnot you're drying out this soil. You know, so it, it is very detrimental, and again, it's one of those things that, you know, the agencies haven't really looked at at all, and that's one of the ways that, you know, when we do these kind of mushroom mics, we can maybe, you know, when we write our comments, suggest to the Forest Service and the BLM that, you know, they do need to look at these other things, not just the above ground and water and, and animals and whatnot, but let's look at what's going on below, uh -huh. you know, and maybe, you know, lessen the impact that we're going to have on what's happening below, because the majority of life on Earth is below ground, you know. There is as much biomass in a forest below ground than there is above. Well, I've read that a healthy, healthy percentage of the biomass of the planet is ants. Well, yeah, and ants High have a huge amount too, right. Yeah, and beetles and all that kind of stuff. And fungus, I mean, you know, they still haven't figured out how much that is. There's a you know, the honey mushroom uh, fungus, one of the largest organisms on earth, or the largest organisms on earth are mushrooms, or fungus, uh, mycelial networks. And one of those is here in eastern Oregon, and it's a honey mushroom, and it's uh, like 3,000 acres. You know, it's all underground, and it pops up mushrooms occasionally whenever it wants to or whenever it, it's right, um, but it's all underground. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. Aren't the tree roots interconnected as well? When you take down one, you're also affecting the tree roots of its neighbor? Yeah, I mean, there's an impact. Like Damage. these clear cuts that are out here that you see, the, the negative effects of those clear cuts go into the native forest up to a quarter mile, maybe even more. Part of, that's, part of that is going to be, you know, uh, drier air and the microclimate that's affected, much less the, especially with the fungus and the other roots that are in that clear cut, affecting the native forest that's still left standing. Right. So yeah, it's, you know, a clear cut isn't just that little square box. It affects the entire area around it as well. There is a disease of wicked proportion Love of money and gold It's cure Basically, chopped up really fine mushrooms with butter and shallots. You can do it. You can veganize it if you want. Um, and then you put in a little uh, soy sauce, just a little bit, a little bit of uh, vegan Worcestershire sauce, and uh, deglaze the pan with either red wine or white wine or Madeira. A little salt and pepper in there too. 
and then you put that on some toasted bread, and I put a little Gruyere cheese on it and grilled it in the oven, and it was mm. sounds tasty. Like, sounds like gourmet to me. Oh, it's totally yeah. gourmet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's damn good. Uh, but With something a little simpler. <laughs> yeah. And basically, you know, cooking chanterelles, especially if they're really uh, wet, you want to put them in the pan, uh, a dry pan first on medium-high heat, and, and uh, dry saute them, and, and it, you release a whole bunch of water. And you can either save that water for your soups or whatnot, or just let it cook off. And then when it's mostly gone, you throw in your butter, your oil, or whatever it is you're going to cook in. And actually, oftentimes, a mix of butter and oil is good. How long do you heat them for? Before that release of water, it takes 30 seconds. And then, and then they turn release. The heat, turn the heat off after 30 seconds? No, no. Uh, that uh, water all releases in 30 seconds, and then you either cook it off for another four or five minutes, or pour it off and save it for your soups. Um, and then from there, you know, basically, garlic is slightly overpowering for chanterelles, so people use shallots and onions uh, to try and still keep that flavor of the mushroom in their dish. Um, as is true with a lot of other mushrooms, they, they you don't use a whole lot of garlic unless you want to. But, um, it's a tiny little yeah, lemon is really good with chanterelles. A little saute of uh, uh, onions and garlic and uh, shallots and butter, oil, and then uh, I put in a little bit of soy sauce at the end, and then squeeze a lemon over the top and kind of let it cook off. And lemon actually goes really well with chanterelles. You put that over rice or whatever. So look it up. Yeah, look it up online. There's, there's a million recipes out there that are really, really, really good. Can you refrigerate them? You should refrigerate them. And how long will they last? A couple weeks at least in the fridge in an open paper bag. Paper bags only, no plastic. You will rot your mushrooms within 12 hours if you put them in plastic. Drying them or keeping them longer? Drying them is actually a great way to, uh, to, to keep them. And then... On a screen or something? Yeah, on the screen or in your oven uh, on a cookie sheet on low heat for a couple hours. It'll take a while. And or uh, cooking them for five or ten minutes in butter or oil, chopping them up, cooking them for five or ten minutes, and then freezing them oh. is a really good way. And that actually retains more of the flavor than uh, the drying. A lot of people think that when you dry them and then rehydrate them, and to rehydrate any dried mushroom, you put it in hot uh, water or hot wine or whatever liquid you want to rehydrate it in for a good 20 minutes and it literally will come back to almost the exact same size and shape as when you first picked it. And with chanterelles a lot of times they get a little rubbery or they're already slightly rubbery, gummy-ish, gummy bearish. Um, and when they're dried and then rehydrated they get a little more um, like that. So a lot of people don't like that. Uh, which is why freezing them, pre-cooking them and the freezing them is really good. But more than just a blanche, an actual cook? Yeah, a little five or ten minutes. You want it to be cooked through, not fully done for your recipe, but, you know. Okay. Marasmias of some sort, and they grow on trees, and this stuff, I mean, this is a, a landscape, if you could see this really down a uh, small macro, or micro, um, like all these lichens, and you know, these are the, uh, the spore-bearing structures of the lichens, huh. and this is the you know, spore-bearing uh, structure of the fungus, and just, uh, yeah, it's just amazing. It's a whole little mini-world, huh? Yeah. And lichens are actually a mix of algae and fungus. There's a lot of fungus in our lives. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every single like needle a, of these Douglas fir trees has a tiny little filamentous mycelial thread that helps actually in photosynthesis and nitrogen um, mm -hmm. uptake. And then, of course, the tree itself oftentimes has mushrooms growing on it, on the moss, on the branches, and then, of course, attached to its roots are all sorts of species of uh, fungus. Hundreds of species conceivably over its lifetime. Grasses crispa, the cauliflower mushroom. It's a great edible, looks kind of like a brain. Uh, is actually <laughs> semi, yeah, semi rare. Like you don't find, you know, tons and tons of them. And they're always growing at the base of a tree because they're attached to the roots of that tree. And they're a, a very, very fine edible. Those alone are amazing. So you're making sure no one poisons himself? Yeah. <laughs> if you eat one of the false ones, will it kill you? Or nope. Just make you really There's sick? a ton of mushrooms that are inedible, but that just means that uh, you'll either have diarrhea or vomiting or upset stomach or whatnot, um, so and it might last for a couple of hours. False.
False sham trails now. There are many, many, many other mushrooms that you can die from. Is there any other mushroom that has the um, amount, the volume of, of uh, availability? Is that is the chanterelle? Chantrel? Not Didn't seem anything really. close. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, there are massive fruitings of morels after fires, uh, but the chanterelle is just ubiquitous everywhere in the state of Oregon, especially, and uh, wherever it's raining and wherever you've got dug firs and some decent forest, you know. So they're tied to dug fir then. Well, dug fir, I mean, hemlocks, all sorts of stuff, but uh, especially like dug firs for sure, um, and they like old road beds, kind of like this, and. Uh, Forest has to be a good at least 35 years old, really, before the, the chanterelles are going to come up. Mushrooms? <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. 